Let's listen in as these two AI game characters have a generated conversation. Quirky is one word for it, Jin. I think we're just too real to be anything but flesh and blood. I know what the AI strategy is for other companies like Microsoft. I know what the AI strategy is for Alphabet. Introducing Microsoft 365 Copilot, your copilot for work. I'm a little freaked out because the AI had some kind of good ideas here. I really don't know how you prevent students from using AI. Procedurally <laughs> generated AI. Unemployment reaches 100%. This avatar is a deep fake. Trillion dollar AI. Artificial intelligence. Played by an AI. Artificial intelligence. In the age of AI. Can AI do my job? Using ChatGPT or using AI. What AI has done is it's just Welcome to our first ever open AI demo. Artificial intelligence will save the world or end it. A lot of the AI operate right now. Twenty twenty three very well may be looked back on as the rise of a new age. The AI years where, depending on who you ask, will either be catapulted into a blissful future or dropped down into the depths of a corporate artless slop of human nature. Some would even say that we're on the cusp of do or die for what it means to be human itself for better or for worse. Now, while the goalposts have shifted, the game is the same. This really isn't anything new. The speed of technology has rapidly increased as human history keeps making itself, with the miniaturization of once room-sized components pushing forward a steady stream of new gadgets that do inevitably reshape human life, from things as little as how we look at a clock to how we communicate with the people we love, the important aspects of our lives. However, the same could be said about any number of advancements throughout history. The introduction of the automobile had huge ripples, the steam engine did the same before that, and the printing press once again the same back through history. Any number of inventions back throughout time could be looked at for this. The pace has increased, but the game is the same. What's being tested isn't actually how a new creation will change us, but how we would utilize a new tool. For example, the car itself didn't magically change the landscape of American life. However, the response to it, where families suddenly fled the cities along newly created highways specifically made to form this kind of automobile dependence, did change our culture. And in this, there were aspects of our culture that were lost for what was gained, of course. We suddenly had lawns and privacy in abundance. We could now go wherever we wanted, whenever we wanted, and rock up right to the front door. But we lost walkability of the cities, much of community that was forced to be there in them, and the inbuilt diversity that the country tried to claim what was founded upon with the ever-famous line, all men are created equal. This is what I'm concerned with here today. We hear a lot about the technological advancements AI will bring, the new ways that we'll watch and shop and talk. But what will be lost to gain those new things? Is the automation of daily tasks something that will make us freer in mind than ever before, or will it crumble our entire psychology? Will we actually end up working less hours, or will we just lose the freedom to find better solutions? And if we do gain all this time as it's said we will, is it merely a front-loading of our lives, taking from the future to add to the present? Of course, the direction of the future is corporate-driven, however, it is wide open. There is no fate. And science has no inherent will. It is up to us alone to use it as the tool it is to craft the world we desire. This new revolution is something we must not face with eyes and ears closed. So today, we'll be looking over the course of our history so far, the wrinkles of our brain right now, and seeing how it all might impact the future we'll live so I can play my part in this game of advancement and world crafting. I, for one, won't take blind chances with my future. And I hope in a couple hours my words and research will work, and you won't either. Now, there's a whole slew of videos covering the AI revolution already. I'm a bit late to the game to catch the wave. But that's because I wanted to do it right and properly zero in on a specific aspect of the positive AI claims and 
Really do some research to put facts to often unsighted statements. As such, in the pinned comment of this video, there will be links to all my sources used, where you can find them in conjunction with the numbers and titles on screen when I'm directly quoting. I encourage you to check them out for yourself rather than simply listen to me as I'm no expert. I do have a degree which includes automation engineering and robotics technology, and these are claims mostly about enhanced automation and not strictly AI. However, I did never really personally work with AI. Anyway, the main claim that I want to tackle is something you can find in almost any article or blog about AI from major publications to personal LinkedIn posts. I'll read a few directly so you can get an idea of it. AI will automate many repetitive and sometimes dangerous tasks like data entry and assembly line manufacturing. The technology will also change the nature of work for many other jobs, allowing workers to focus on higher value and higher touch tasks that often require interpersonal interactions. The net gain argument states that, like all automation, AI can be an aggregate wealth creator because it creates new opportunities. By delegating tedious tasks to a machine, we give ourselves time to focus on more complex problems, share knowledge, and be creative. Despite these concerns, AI also offers significant opportunities and has the potential to revolutionize almost every aspect of our lives. One of the most significant impacts of AI on the workplace is increased efficiency and productivity. AI-powered tools can automate repetitive and time-consuming tasks, freeing up employees to focus on more strategic and creative work. What stands out among all of these kind of posts to me are these phrases. Repetitive tasks, automated, higher value tasks, tedious tasks, complex problems, increased productivity, time-consuming tasks. They all basically summarize to AI will take care of mundane tasks, allowing us to be more productive, involved, and free. Now, there's no denying that these tasks will go away with tech. We've seen again and again that the nature of work changes with the advent of new technology. I wouldn't be so silly as to argue that that's false. So this sounds great on the surface. Without having to perform all these time-wasting activities, whether at home or at work, we'd have to reach some kind of paradise, right? But you'll notice that the benefits of these claims are never actually backed up. We can see the basis of it, but they're simply assuming the positive results based on simple logic. Productivity goes up, time spent at work goes down. No low value tasks wasting time, more solutions get created. It sounds right enough, which is why they never research it. But isn't the psychological impact of constantly working on the hardest tasks a bit more complex than just A plus B equals C? Isn't the social dynamics of the workplace between employer and employee way off of a linear path? Even if we take this simple relationship of productivity and time worked, it's only valuable in relation to output. But will that output be consistent? Simple logic doesn't apply to these situations. So I did the kind of research they don't to judge for myself. I won't say it's all negative or anywhere near conclusive, but it does provide a great picture of how complex this web of issues really is. So let's start with the workplace claims. One of them, although not as stated as the others, is that with AI automating all these tasks, we'll finally be able to achieve that four or three or possibly even two day work week that everyone dreams of. If everyone can suddenly tackle those important tasks and not the mundane ones, productivity shoots up and we maintain a nice cruise of progress from our homes instead of at our desks. Utopia achieved. Except nothing in human history actually supports this is how things would play out. Of course, this wouldn't be a good little workplace topic video essay without taking some ideas from the 2013 article on the phenomenon of bullshit jobs from David Graeber. In the year 1930, John Maynard Keynes predicted that by centuries end, technology would have advanced sufficiently that countries like Great Britain or the United States would have achieved a 15 hour work week. There's every reason to believe he was right. In technological terms, we are quite capable of this, and yet it didn't happen. Instead, technology has been marshaled, if anything, to figure out ways to make us all work more. In order to achieve this, jobs have had to be created that are effectively pointless. Huge swaths of people in Europe and North America in particular spend their entire lives performing tasks they secretly believe do not really need to be performed. The moral and spiritual damage that comes from this situation is profound. It is a scar across our collective soul. 
it is hard to resist quoting from this article because even just that opening paragraph is so biting and fierce against this important issue. Graeber's making the point that the simple logic we covered was false. Our capacity has greatly increased. We're all producing much more than we did before, and yet the work week has remained the same. The equation has balanced itself out in our disfavor. One theory as to why points to consumerism, that we ourselves had an ooh shiny reaction to all the new things being produced, and we accepted these conditions to continually purchase such new things. Of course, he doesn't believe this is the root. Over the course of the last century, the number of workers employed as domestic servants in industry and in the farm sector has collapsed dramatically. At the same time, professional, managerial, clerk, sales, and service workers tripled, growing from one quarter to three quarters of total employment. In other words, productive jobs have, just as predicted, been largely automated away. What arose from the modern era of advancement was mostly middlemen. Admin, corporate law, financial services, jobs, and positions which only exist within their own little economy. Their impact is confined to an industry which doesn't actually have a reason to exist. Farming exists because we need food to survive. But corporate lawyers only exist because corporations exist and they have no inherent reason to be. Graeber goes on to make the point simpler. What would happen if all these jobs simply disappeared? If all the nurses or dock workers went away, we notice there would be cataclysmic results to daily life. There'd be shortages and people would be dying from the lack of medical care all over the place. But if all the corporate lawyers disappeared, would you even notice? Nothing in your life would actually change. This is what he calls the bullshit job. Work which exists for no reason but to be work. People who actually perform only those 15 hours of meaningful duties that Keynes predicted, but they're still at the office for 40 to 50 hours a week anyway, stuck in meetings and organizing pointless files. Now, a flaw, you might say. Why would companies pay people to do nothing? That doesn't make sense. If they're squeezing out profits, why would they pay for nothing? But the reason, he says, is political and moral. A person with free time is a threat as they can start to really have the energy to consider the world and its fairness or, or lack thereof to understand if the goods they receive in exchange for their services actually provide fulfillment. As such, keeping people busy serves as a tool of control. This goes further, he believed, into a way to turn people against each other rather than their rulers. The idea of working 40 hour weeks is spoken about like a moral righteousness, a proof of character where anyone doing less is a taker. At the same time, those working these bullshit jobs lament their position knowing how little they're needed, and as such value of the truly important jobs, the dock workers and the nurses and more, becomes not money, but fulfillment. Those jobs pay less because they provide something those overseeing from up high don't have. It's as if they are being told, but you get to teach children or make cars. You get to have real jobs. And on top of that, you have the nerve to also expect middle-class pension and healthcare. In summary, advancements don't yield more time for the worker because more time for the worker is against what those in power are actually seeking. Instead, its toil and drain is used in a cycle to perpetuate itself, directing value into all the wrong places. While Graeber quite adeptly takes shots at the issue, I think it's best to add more research to the claims. In MIT Press, the Reader article, A Brief History of Consumer Culture, lays out some specifics, with its ironic name given it's actually a quite lengthy adaptation of the author Carolyn Higgs' book, Collision Court, Endless Growth on a Finite Planet. What we first acknowledge is that there was a point where, due to the tireless efforts of workers and enhanced regulation, rights did improve. The labor struggles of the 19th century had, without jeopardizing the burgeoning productivity, gradually eroded the seven-day week of 14 and 16-hour days that was worked at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England. In the United States in particular, economic growth had succeeded in providing basic security to the great majority of an entire population. While this signified great things to the worker, it showed 
terrible ones to those profiting from them. They were starting to get less for more in a tide which would not stem itself. And so they found a point and took a stand. Things would not progress any further. We can see this past the turn of the century where those achievements were made and into the next one where they stalled. For example, during the Great Depression, Kellogg implemented a six-hour shift intended to accommodate a larger swath of workers so everyone could get a piece of what was left during tough times. And well, people loved it. Not for that, but for the hours. Especially into World War II where most of the workers were women who had even more responsibilities at home than usual. People valued their time taking care of their own life much more than a couple extra hours of work. The pay simply wasn't as valuable as the time because it actually made life harder to be away for that long. A newer toaster or radio didn't make up for literally not getting to be around for the important moments. It was so enjoyed that when Kellogg went to reset to the 8 hour shifts after World War II ended, workers voted to keep it by a ratio of 3 to 1 in favor two years in a row. However, over time the 6 hour shifts were all phased out, regardless of the benefit and popularity. This is exactly what we saw proposed in bullshit jobs. Against tangible benefits, control was favored even at higher costs. And this isn't a trend which has changed in any way. We're still working those same 8 hour, 5 day a week shifts that we were forced into perpetuation back then, despite the average ability's worker to produce shooting through the roof. A few months ago, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics released an article titled Looking at the Growing Productivity of American Workers for Labor Day, which showed exactly this trend, although they ironically tried to spin it in a different light. Since 2000, labor productivity has increased 1.5% per year. This is because output, the amount of goods and services the economy produces, grew faster than the total hours worked. With productivity glasses on, that is a positive news. From 2000 to 2022, US workers produced about 60% more stuff and only increased their hours worked by 10%. This efficiency in productivity means more time for fun activities like an afternoon baseball game with friends. I mean, they literally just finished writing that hours worked increased and then says this leaves more for the good old American pastimes. Come on, guys. But if we were able to produce 60% more stuff, then why are we working 10% more hours? Obviously, as the world itself grows and gets more advanced, we can't expect a one-to-one -one rise and drop. For example, the US population grew by some 15% in this time, so we obviously had to produce a bit more to maintain the level we knew at the very least. But 15% isn't 60%, and to see that such a large gain led to not even a small drop in, but rather an increase in time worked is the exact opposite of everything these articles state. Now, some sources like this one from the Economic Policy Institute show that 60% increase from 1979 to 2020 and not 2000 to 2020, meaning there's wiggle room for the exact percentage of growth. But it's undeniable that there's been growth without the proposed benefits, which that later article highlights even more by showing that wages haven't kept course with those production gains either. During the period of that 60% increase in productivity, compensation only grew 13.7%. In cold, hard facts, people are being paid less for more. Not only are we spending more time doing this, we're getting paid less than ever in respect to it. I think it's clear to see that the arguments made by Graeber and others have a very solid footing. There's definitive historical proof that as the amount each worker can do rises, we don't actually see the benefits of our own greater level of work. So why would we expect the current AI advancements to be any different than this? The language that's used to sell you on something new by corporations is never the reality of the situation, so we can't expect these claims of less hours worked to be true. Our productivity will rise, but the hours will remain steady, and this simply means more and more will be squeezed out of every single one of us. Not because of AI, but because of the ones selling us on AI. I think this nature of lies and theft is best shown in a quote from a section about consumerism that I cut out of this video. It comes from the 1929 article, Keep the Consumer Dissatisfied, by Charles F. Kettering, the head of research at GM in that era. He speaks about an interaction with a customer where he realizes the point of advancements from the corporate view is only to keep the average person dissatisfied. Not long ago, one of the great bankers of the country said to me, 
The trouble with you fellows is that you are all the time changing automobiles and depreciating old cars. And you are doing it at a time when people have three or four payments to make on the cars they already have. Yesterday, I got an engraved invitation from one of your companies to see a new model. Out of curiosity, I went. I darn near bought one. I didn't because you people wouldn't allow me enough money for my old car. A few weeks later, I was talking with this banker. He appeared to be greatly disgruntled. I bought the new model, he barked, but it was a rotten shame that I had to accept so much depreciation on my old car. You are the fellow who is to blame. You, with all your changes and refinements, made me dissatisfied with the old model. He paused, then added mournfully, and that old car ran like new. I told him I thought it was worth what he paid, that is, the difference between the old and new model, to have his mind changed. He didn't argue over that, but he did say something to the general effect that the only reason for research is to keep your customers reasonably dissatisfied with what they already have. I might observe here and now that he was right. But seeing that hours won't drop is just the first step because then we have to address what comes after those claims, which is that we'll be left to tackle all those high value tasks which require the human mind, the real meat of the job, not blankly performing small tasks in front of a screen. Now, I already have some issues with this idea because most people I know kind of hate their entire job, not just the dull parts of it. I'm from the tail end of the be an engineer because it's good money era, so there's lots of us who took on work that we never really liked and even went into debt to do so. So is it really beneficial to us that we'll be doing only the most difficult parts of the job and not the easy, if mundane ones? This sounds just like the days won't only be the same length, but maybe even longer, but actually more exhausting too, as you never get a break now. But some people do enjoy their jobs. On the flip side of engineering, which I hate three days a week, I'm, well, this, another three. And I absolutely love it. I spent nights off writing this script because it was genuinely a fun experience for me to finally put all this research to use and plan out a style I'd never gotten to do before. If you took away all the faff like uploading and writing descriptions and simple editing, then it would be a paradise of only the thing I love, right? Well, only in a vacuum. If there's nothing else going on in life, that's great. But we all have days where we simply can't achieve high value tasks because of some interruption from outside of work, like a car breakdown, a loss in the family, or sometimes just generally because we couldn't that day. The human isn't a very reliable machine. For me, those days are when I get those mundane tasks done. If I'm stressed out, I'll work on thumbnails. If I'm feeling brain fog, I'll do basic editing. If I know I'm probably gonna be interrupted, I'll write descriptions and plan titles. That means that whatever is going on in life, I can stay productive and feel good about getting something done despite the odds, rather than writing a bunch of content I'll just end up throwing away because I hate it anyway and was in a bad headspace. But that's all I could do. I don't want to only have that high value task to work on because I'll be worse if that's what I'm doing every day. Now you might say, but what's the issue? Because those low value task days can simply become days off. That might be true for self-employment in some cases, but not in ones where people get paid hourly, which I've done before, and let me tell you, it's even more stressful than nine to five work because you only get paid when you produce. If you take a 15 minute break, that's 15 less minutes of pay. And similarly, it doesn't apply to those working the usual schedule because you'll still be at work and expected to produce. Your boss won't suddenly say, yeah, go home and we'll pay you for doing nothing today. Unless there are massive social changes, you won't simply be given extra days off to compensate. Plus, having small tasks to achieve is important. It feels good to check boxes off that to-do list, even if there's something anyone could do anytime. The satisfaction which is created is what helps drive us to tackle the more important goals as we prove to ourselves we can be productive and get shit done. I don't really wanna lose that confidence boost. And there's something deeper at play here too. We often think of the extremes of this scale as where greatness comes from, either periods of crunch and intense productivity or the absolute freedom to do anything. But there's somewhere in the middle we probably don't give enough credit to, which shows that these low value tasks may be at the heart of our ability to tackle important problems. And that in between is 
the shower. A 2022 study titled The Shower Effect, Mind Wandering Facilitates Creative Incubation During Moderately Engaging Activities. I know such a catchy title. It proposed exactly what it sounds like, the shower effect. Everyone has anecdotal stories of how their great ideas came at the most inconvenient time of being in the shower. Many of the most emotional scripts I've written over the years, for example, started forming during one. There could be a multitude of reasons for this. It's relaxing and comforting, so our minds are more at ease, more free from the rest of the world for a moment, so our stress is probably down, or maybe humans just really like falling water and we find ourselves inspired. The team making this paper set out to find a more definitive reason behind those anecdotes than just guesswork, though, looking at the idea of mind wandering and how it impacts our ability to tackle problems. Although they were specifically following from a 2012 study, and due to both it being the origin and the current study being paywalled, we'll be dipping back to the study inspired by distraction, mind wandering facilitates creative incubation to explore this concept instead. Anecdotes of individuals solving problems after relinquishing the effort to solve them date back millennia. Indeed, many influential scientific thinkers, including Neunten, Poincaré, and Einstein, claim to have had their moments of inspiration while engaged in thoughts or activities not deliberately aimed at solving the problem they were trying to solve. A key question that arises from such examples is whether engaging in any type of unrelated cognition increases the frequency of creative solutions or whether the thoughts that yield such insights have specific features. One common example of thinking that is unrelated to an overt goal is the internally generated thought that occupies one's attention during mind wandering. Several lines of research suggest that mind wandering could be linked to enhanced creativity, particularly for problems that have been previously encountered. The goal here was to bring together multiple ideas. The team was working off the conclusions of a few previous studies and seeking to bring those aspects into one to create a more conclusive answer. Specifically, those inspirational results were that individuals prone to mind wandering, such as those with ADHD, were observed to receive better scores on laboratory measures of creativity than individuals without, that continual attempts to solve a problem without break tends to undermine creativity, and that incubation, a period of stepping away from the work at hand, yields greater benefits when used to perform undemanding tasks over demanding tasks or no task at all. They wanted to bring these aspects of distinct studies into one to answer a criticism. Was it the easier tasks which specifically helped with known problems, or just something else within the process of shifting like that which did? With 145 participants aged 19 and 32, they began with a baseline UUT, the unusual uses task, a test which asked the participant to come up with unusual uses for a particular object. For example, I have a pencil here. Normally you just write and erase with it. Those would be the usual uses. But you could also stir a drink with it, point to objects during a presentation with it, keep it behind your ears, and you could technically eat food with it, although not all at once, hopefully. The participants were asked to create a list similar to that for their baseline. Afterwards, they were split into four groups. One had no incubation period and began the next UUT, while the other three groups had 12 minutes of rest, one of just quiet rest, another with an undemanding task, and the last one with a demanding task. Those final two need a bit more explanation. The undemanding process was to focus on a series of black numbers appearing on screen with an interval of one second on and one and a half seconds off. Infrequently, a colored number would come up on screen, and they had to record whether it was even or odd. The demanding task was similar, however the target was a colored question mark, and they'd have to record whether the previous number was even or odd. As you can see, one is fairly simple. You don't really have to engage your mind for it, you're just sitting there looking and oh, there it is. However, the other requires your constant attention as you're trying to remember the last one and be aware of the current one. Uh, it's not just current observation, which creates an undemanding task and a demanding task respectively. After these breaks, the participants self-reported mind wandering on a commonly used measure so that this factor could be measured between the three groups. A separate questionnaire also assessed the frequency of thoughts about the UUT during the period of incubation. 
Then they took the second unusual uses task, which measured creativity based on new responses while also accounting for fluency and creativity overlap with two independent raters. Now, the survey results found that both the demanding and undemanding task groups thought about the test the same amount during their break, but the undemanding group reported a greater level of mind wandering. Despite this, there was no difference in accuracy for the number test between both groups. What the results showed was very promising. When given a period of incubation for a previously encountered problem with an undemanding task versus a demanding one, a 40% improvement was found on the UUT, which was unmatched in the other three categories, although no break was a very clear worst option. This means that not just is a break from the issue at hand beneficial, but that if you want to address it properly and find the best answer, a break with an undemanding task is the most proper way to do so. While studies since have had trouble replicating these results, the previously mentioned 2022 study did replicate them, and the authors believe that the lack of repeatability in others was due to the laboratory tasks chosen being unrepresentative of true life conditions, and as such not really creating mind wandering, but simply testing for distraction. The typical task you use in mind wandering research is called a sustained attention response test. And what that test involves is, for example, seeing a stream of digits, one through nine, and not clicking when you see a three. That's the typical mind wandering study. They're just not like anything in people's lives. That's important because the shower effect likely depends on the context you're in. Mind wandering might help in some contexts, like taking a walk, but not in others, like a dull psych test. So when we pair this with our topic here today of automating away undemanding tasks, we see some pretty serious results from those claims about AI's benefits. We'll be at work for eight hours a day, five days a week still, as we showed in the last section, but now we'll be dedicating all that time to solving high value, often stressful problems. We won't be getting any more breaks than usual, and we can't even swap to a mundane task now, which as we just saw, are the best ways to find creative solutions to previously faced problems, meaning we'll be drowning in the same issues all day without the most beneficial way to address them and truly be productive. That just sounds like the worst days of our work becoming the normal. It's not just that there are detriments left off the usual claims, but that the claims may actually just be flat out wrong. Without low value tasks to tackle, we may just end up in a soup of the worst ideas as we repeat previous solutions again and again since we're less likely to create new ones. If we want to truly advance, we may have to leave time for things like the shower, where our mind is engaged enough to be active at a moderate level, but not enough to be at capacity. The bit of time spent entering some data may be what let you succeed. That space where our mind wanders is more important than we may know and I don't think it's something we should be trying to lose. Now, the inclusion of the shower, a distinctly not work task, hopefully, raises another aspect of the question. How does all this apply to home life? One of the other parts of that claim is that AI, or more generally advanced automation's use outside of work, will be just as beneficial as the tasks we toil away at every single day become features of the past and we're more free to leisure about like a sci-fi paradise. I don't have as vigorous a disagreement here, but as always I think it's worth considering what we're losing before we do away with it. We all hate doing the dishes and folding laundry and cleaning the bathroom, but will our lives truly get better without those tasks? Well, a cohort study from the UK spanning 14 years and over 500,000 participants can shed some light on the positive long-term effects of these tasks we all hate so much. Now, some background for the study. It was able to have such a wide scope because it utilized the UK Biobank a bank of volunteers aged between 40 and 69 at the time of enrollment, and set to be followed by the study for 30 years to observe potential long-term correlations that arose in their health and situations. Everyone accepted was brought in for an initial questionnaire about their lifestyle, history, and habits, as well as a general physical which collected height, weight, blood samples, with the addition of urine samples as well. 
One of the major criticisms of the project, however, is that it's relatively non-diverse, sampling mostly from white middle class or greater participants, which will skew the data in some ways. It's not invalidating, but it is something we have to note. The specific study we'll be looking at, Physical and Mental Activity, Disease Susceptibility, and Risk of Dementia is from 2022, and performed data analysis utilizing those initial questionnaires about lifestyle and habits, which included categories such as physical activity at leisure time, i.e. strenuous sports, other exercise, walking for pleasure, and climbing a flight of stairs, housework-related activity, e.g. heavy and light DIY, job-related activity, i.e. job involved standing or walking, and job involved heavy or manual physical activity, a mouthful, but it was also gathering information about the frequency and duration were applicable, such as how often they'd walk or watch TV and for how long. With this data and the time that had passed since 2006, they were able to see which participants developed which conditions and seek out patterns in the data correlating those to their lifestyles and habits. They also measured this against the person's susceptibility for something like dementia based on family history. That way they could determine whether it was the habits or the genetics at play. Besides that, there's not much methodology to cover because it was a lot of data analysis rather than the laboratory work of our last study. Now, I had to learn a few new terms to read the paper because I'm not a statistics person, so if you check it out, you might find the need to do the same thing. But a few Googles and rereads of sections, and the results showed a correlation between certain lifestyle factors and a reduced risk of dementia, as well as an increased risk from others. These were found to be independent of the individual's specific susceptibility as well. Exercise at leisure time, housework-related activity, family or friend visits, and group activities or adult educational courses all showed a potential reduced risk. I'm saying potential because it's just correlation in the data, which would need specific, lengthy, and costly studies to show more definitively. But the large sample size of the study still makes a strong case because it reduces the risk of outliers driving the data. And the researchers themselves admit some flaws. More repetitive measurements of activity would be beneficial, and the delay in diagnosis of conditions like dementia may actually lead to reverse causality, which warrants future studies. That is, most cases aren't found immediately, but after many signs begin to show, and so their habits may have already been altered by the disease by the time of intake. However, they're also clear that their results match up with other studies about the benefits of physical activities risk reduction, and admitting faults is a normal part of every single study and one which shows good faith. What I really find interesting about this is how the housework-related activity is second only to dedicated exercise in terms of potential risk reduction. Vigorous and other exercise at leisure time led to a hazard ratio of 0.65 for those reporting a high amount of this behavior, while housework-related activity led to a 0.79 hazard ratio for those reporting a high level of the behavior. Now, hazard ratio is one of the terms I had to learn, but in simple words, it's the chance of an event occurring compared to a baseline or a control where a lower number is reduced risk. Here the baseline is minimal participation in that specific activity or habit, which gives that a hazard ratio of 1. So you can see this as far as I understand it, as vigorous exercise having a potential 35% reduction risk, and housework related activity having a potential 21% reduction in risk. Now, again, there's a lot of gray areas here and the numbers change depending on subtypes of dementia or other conditions, but it shows a potential very strong link between these activities and greater health in later life. Exercise we'd all expect, but housework related activity? Those things we all bemoan like laundry and dishes and cleaning the bathroom are actually a strong factor in protecting our brains into later life? I think we can see this in conjunction with our last section though. These are most often undemanding tasks. When I'm cleaning the bathroom, it's a little bit vigorous, but you know what you have to do. It's not a new process every time. You just start to do it on autopilot, scrubbing away. Your mind certainly starts to wander to other things. Just like in the shower, I've had great ideas doing this or meal prep or laundry because they're engaging my body and mind just enough to let my brain really go at it. If anything, the important realizations that usually make my videos work come in these times away from my computer where everything condenses together in a new light. So it makes sense that being in this healthy range of brain activity would be beneficial for our long-term health as well. It's like a brisk walk for the mind that we can't escape. Those chores are forcing us to all stay active in a beneficial way. 
Now, it would be a stretch to say that eliminating these tasks would be a guaranteed negative for us. After all, there are other categories that reduce or increase risk just the same. But it is very well worth noting that the most prominent categories were all ones that fall into a space of mundanity or mind wandering very easily. So were we to begin giving over all of these daily tasks to AI or generally to automation, would we be placing ourselves in more danger in the long run? Front-loading our lives by letting our brains change in negative ways down the road? Not only would we be worse at ideas even more so, but we'd be using our brains in that super beneficial way a lot less than before. We might have more and more time, and that's of course great, but will that time be as valuable? I hate these daily tasks like anyone else, but I don't also like the idea of not maintaining my own life. It's mine, and I think that as someone healthy you can do so without harm, it's best for me to put in effort to keep it as it is. It keeps me active and keeps me respecting how valuable my time is. While I'd like more time, I wouldn't give up those tasks without first knowing what it could really do in the long run. Let's go even one step further. We covered the workplace and the home and already shown false a lot of those AI file claims. But in the most exaggerated of the benefits they propose is a world entirely without stress, where humans live free and open lives as machines take care of every task. I guess they're not worried about sin punishing them for using Machina or anything like that. There's no way this would happen, as we already covered, and if it did, many others also predict it would basically be an unemployment hell where a select few hyper elites transfer around mega wealth, not some kind of social paradise, but we'll entertain the thought anyway. Because a world without stress would have to be perfect, right? I mean, it's one of the things that we all hate most, and it's known to have huge detriments on our health and well-being. But this is actually a bit of a misunderstanding. There are two terms which should actually be used here. Stress and distress often used as synonyms, but they have important distinctions. Now, there is no one true definition of stress because it's impacting subjective creatures, even if we can observe some objective ways that it does so. But to give a general rounded definition, a general distillation of the literature suggests that stress denotes a real or perceived perturbation to an organism's physiological homeostasis or psychological well-being. In its stress response, the body uses a constellation of behavioral or psychological mechanisms to counter the perturbation and return to normalcy. So stress isn't exactly what it's colloquially come to be known as, where we often talk about a job which is consistently taxing, for example, but rather it is a temporary state where the body is driven out of its usual rhythm, activates responses to regain that consistent state. It implements internal solutions to adapt and overcome. It's things like increased blood flow to the muscles during the ever famous fight or flight response. Of course, this induces discomfort. You know that tense feeling. However, that allows the organism to survive the situation through the enhanced use of those muscles, whereupon it returns to normal. And so stress itself is actually a beneficial thing when we consider the wide scope. After all, the following are all considered stressors, although they elicit variable behavioral and physiological responses. Viral or bacterial infection, threat of physical harm, drugs, exercise, sexual activity, high altitude, restraint, hunger, and thirst. Many of the above elicit useful or good stress, which is beneficial to the animal in the long term. So what is it that we often talk about as stress then? Well, that would be distress, which is, in simplified terms, when our response fails to deal with the stressor. Most definitions characterize distress as an aversive, negative state in which coping and adaptation processes fail to return an organism to physiological and or psychological homeostasis. So stress transitions into something bad in distress, and this can happen for many reasons. We can either have insufficient responses to where we don't overcome the stressor or excessive responses to the point where we over adapt against it. However, two important notes between all of these varieties are both the duration and intensity of the stressor. 
being restrained for a short while won't destroy your mental health. However, if you're left there for a long while, it will of course have a physiological effect, for example. But in this, you can also see a key factor, which is control. If an organism has the ability to predict and control the stressor to a degree, the same amount of exposure can have very different effects compared to a not. If you know that you can be released at any time or if someone even friendly is restraining you, then that restraint won't be nearly as bad as if you're left to wonder what the extent will be. So we have to consider two things, stress, which is beneficial and healthy, and de-stress, which is not. Now, how does this apply to things here today? Well, as we're going through, keep in mind the things that are often reported as going to be automated away and the patterns that we'll create as we get into our next study. Um, the acute stress enhances adult rapid hippocampal neurogenesis and activation of newborn neurons via secreted acetosic FGF2. They weren't as interested in a catchy title as the other studies, it seems. Also, this section will deal with laboratory animal testing, not in any way that was outside of the agreed upon rules and conditions. However, I understand that's still not pleasant for some, no matter what. So I'll subchapter out this section so you can just skip all the discussion of that if you want to. But moving on, this 2013 study tested the effects of acute stress, that is short term stress on rats, particularly when they focus on the hippocampus. That's because a particular subregion of the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, contains many stress receptors for certain chemical stress hormones, glutocorticoids, and is also notable for being one of the only two subregions of the adult mammalian brain that can give rise to new neurons via a process called neurogenesis, which means it can actually grow new stem cells to give rise to greater brain function no matter the age compared to the other regions of the brain which don't exhibit that quality. In short, they wanted to see if acute stress would increase brain function tested through memory capabilities. To study this, some lab rats were restrained for a few hours at a time to induce the acute stress, while others were directly injected with the stress hormone corticosterone. Two other methodologies were utilized, however they showed no significant effect, so for time's sake here we're going to omit them. Now, the former two led to an increase in neurogenesis, which is that process of new neuron formation that we mentioned previously. It also induced increased expression of a growth factor called FGF2, which is a potent and necessary proliferative factor in adult NPCs. NPC stands for neural progenitor cells or stem cells. Unfortunately, the experiments did not make non-playable characters just appear from thin air like some kind of Bethesda project. Now this is a lot of technical jargon from a pretty specific field, but what it boils down to is that these two processes of inducing or directly applying the responses of acute stress led to the creation of new cells in the brain within adult mammals, which is generally not the most common occurrence. Now, this needed a little bit more to determine if it was actually beneficial though, which is where those memory tests began to come into play. Those same rats were then put through a process involving fear conditioning and fear extinction, which tests how quickly an animal can both learn and then unlearn a specific behavior. To do this, they needed to draw an association within the brain, which involves the scarily named fear conditioning chamber, where the rats were exposed to minor electrical shocks. As such, they understand the relation that being in the chamber equates to pain, eliciting a fear response anytime they're placed in the same chamber later on, which for them resulted in freezing in place. As such, they were of course later replaced in the chamber without electrical shock in order to recondition them away from that fear of the chamber, breaking the association in their mind as their new experiences contradicts their expectations. This is where the researchers could start to gather cold, hard data. With the rats who were immobilized or injected earlier to induce brain growth from acute stress, reconditioned quicker than those who didn't, proving an increased utilization of those new brain cells. Well, two days later, there was no change between them and the control group. However, two weeks later, they showed an improvement of around 15% over the control group in the fear extinction trial meaning they froze for 15% less time when reintroduced to the fear conditioning chamber. This seems odd at first, 
but that two weeks is actually a very important timeline. Moreover, the beneficial effects were seen if the rats performed the task two weeks after their stressful experience, but not if they performed the task two days after being stressed. This is pertinent because new neurons in the dentate gyrus become functional two weeks after being generated, which suggests that the stress-induced increase in neurogenesis could account for the rats' improved memory. Further examination after these trials also found that immobilized rats showed a greater percentage of actively utilized newly born neurons, suggesting the potential for later memory benefits. This was a complicated process, but in simple terms, using specialized cell labeling techniques, they were able to see that the new nerve cells grown in response to the acute stress were actually the ones being utilized. As with all things, this isn't some end-all be-all of a conclusive study, but it shows some very strong evidence for the benefits of stress. And this all makes sense. In nature, stress is strongly associated with survival. Again, the famous fight or flight response. Animals which are able to adapt and respond quickly to stressors are the ones which are going to survive. In a brain which grows new cells in relation to memory in order to store information about how to deal with that stressor if it's faced again, or even more how to forget that information if it doesn't truly apply to make room for more information, is one which is going to succeed even more and re reproduce even more. This is all well and good, but we aren't really creatures on the brink of survival anymore, so is this really all that relevant? Well, well of course it is. I wouldn't have recorded it all if it wasn't because it, it wouldn't be in the script, and I certainly wouldn't have like edited it and published it if it wasn't relevant. That, that's a really weird question to ask. Jokes aside, you've probably already seen the through line connecting back to our previous studies. We know that stepping away from demanding tasks to undemanding ones is what provides the best solutions. But then this also adds a layer of both stress and de-stress to it. When we're allowed to step away and ponder in the background instead of focusing on these demanding tasks, we leave that stress as something acute. It's there, we have some level of control over it, and then we, we leave it behind leading to benefits for our brains before we tackle it again in a better state. This is healthy and good. Now, what if we consider a world with only demanding tasks? Even if we can swap between different ones, they're still much more stressful than the automated away tasks we used to swap to, leaving us in the grips of stress for longer periods of time, more easily turning it into distress. Pondering the next day at work after a stressor, we won't be able to say things like, well, I'll just handle the small things, get through the day, send those emails, or reorganize my files so I'm more efficient later, it'll be fine. That's something we can kind of do right now. But if we don't have those things to do, each night could be full of worry for the next because there's no break from high demands. And that would be a maladaptive preparation for danger, leaving one stuck in anxiety which should only be temporary to deal with danger. Our ability to properly adapt to stress goes down, and we begin to mal or overly adapt more often. Of course, it's still hypothetical. Certain workplaces may allow for some social changes which alleviate these issues, or the nature of work could change so entirely to invalidate all of this. But it's just as possible that it doesn't. And this is what we're left with. A state of distress where we never get the necessary benefits of stress. Late night come home, work sucks, I know. She left me roses by the stairs, surprises let me know she cares. All the Small Things is a 1999 song from Blink-182 that you've no doubt heard countless times in your life, probably to the point of annoyance. For the band themselves, it became that way even, it seems. I really just wanted to use the lyrics as a title or hook for this section, but when I was checking to make sure I got them just exactly right, I came across this from the singer Tom DeLong speaking on the song's origins. All the Small Things is a song I wrote for my girlfriend while we were recording. I had to write her a song because I wrote songs about other girls, but I haven't written one for her. But the lyrics are totally true in that song, She Left Me Roses by the Stairs. I remember I came home late one night, about midnight, and she left roses on the stairs because I was working late every night in the studio. 
It's a famous example of something we've all at some point found in our lives, the importance of these small gestures, most notably in our relationships with others. Whether it's someone making the bed, popping some off-brand waffles in the toaster with their own view, or taking the dog for a walk before you've even woken up, these are all things that really added minimal disruption to their day, from a few seconds in some cases to minutes in others, but all time that would have to be spent anyway. You still have to walk the dog whether it's now or later. The difference is just that you utilize that already spent time to care for someone else. They're almost entirely undemanding or low value tasks that if done for ourselves, we wouldn't even think twice about the importance of, but in relation to the others, they're most often what's seen as markers of true and enduring care. As with everything in this video, we can relate it back a little bit. It means that in these undemanding tasks, their mind is wandering and it's wandering to you. The result of that research is in a small way proof of this gauge that we all use. But there's much more research done, so we don't have to rely on tangential logic alone. A large survey of over 4,000 participants from 2013, once again centered in the UK, titled The Enduring Love Project, provides some insight on this topic. Unfortunately, as with the last UK-based study, it's also predominantly white, so there is an inherent skew to the results, although this time it wasn't inherently laid out or recruited to be that way. This is because participants weren't recruited directly, but the scope was created through advertising. No direct links were provided to the survey, but ads were placed for the project on sites related to relationships, parenting, and other similar topics in order to draw in consenting participants who would seek out the survey on their own, ensuring more truthful and responsive answers. The purpose of the survey was to look for correlations between reported aspects of their relationship and measures of their happiness with both that relationship and life overall. It included agreement to questions on a scale from one to five. Things such as, we share our domestic chores fairly, we argue over money, or even small aspects like we share a bedroom, as well as demographic reporting such as education level or sexual orientation, things like that. There was also an open-ended section where they could write out responses to questions like, identify two things that you like best about your relationship, or the same exact question, but substitute worst in for best. Now, the team combing over the data found many factors with really no correlation to relationship and life satisfaction. Things like religious status, prior long-term relationship status, and the level of education, things like that didn't really have an impact. But others did show a significant change. For example, non-heterosexual participants with no children ranked happiest among the sexuality and parenthood demographics for happiness consistently across the board. It's maybe just a little sign that the people who have to really think about themselves and their identity and their path in life and how to live tend to be more fulfilled and we should all do that a little bit more. But take away that from wherever you will, that's just my suggestion. What we're really here for are the open-ended questions. Now, the researchers didn't intend for them to be such a large part of the study, but they ended up receiving over 10,000 responses, which they felt obligated to read and classify because of the value they really unexpectedly found in them. We considered coding only a random sample extracted from these data, but the quality of the answers was too rich to lose, and so all were ultimately coded. The classification meant coding the answers with general terms so that they could find emerging patterns to the questions, which resulted in 25 codes. For example, in answer to the question, two things that your partner does that makes you feel appreciated, if one participant said something like, buys me flowers, and another one gets me cards on special occasions, those would both be lumped together in the same category, which we can see with gives me cards, gifts, flowers, etc. Now, after coding, what the researchers found is that the top 15 categories accounted for 91% of responses, providing a great picture of what made people feel happy or appreciated, or what they liked best or least about their relationships. And the top answers are primarily small or mundane gestures or already required tasks. For example, things like does the household chores, cooks meals, or makes me tea or coffee, and many more are subjective measures of communication, small things like says thank you, as well as compliments and physical affection. 
The answers are really striking in their simplicity, showing pure examples of what we enjoy most about our relationships with the others. Lots of small gestures, such as leaving me the last chocolate. Makes me tea. No, really, it's the little things. She writes me love notes and folds the laundry, which I hate to do. She leaves little cards for me that say nice things on them. Every year, he brings me an orange rose from the garden he maintains. Shows he loves me, runs a bath after work, helps with children in the mornings. If he is the first one in the bathroom before we go to bed, he puts the toothpaste on my toothbrush for me. I'm not ashamed to admit that the first time I was reading through these answers, I really started to tear up a bit. To see how accessible and manageable this confusing concept we call love can be fills me with some of the purest hope I could ever express for the human race. That it doesn't have to be about lifetimes and, and grand occurrences, but that really all we want is to be with people in simple ways. To know that we are worth all the small efforts in the wide and varied life of another person just like us. Is there anything more beautiful than that, that about our species? The way we can be so simple despite our complexity is stunning in the greatest way. We could list anything and everything from expensive gifts to far and away trips, and what we focus on is running baths, a flower from the garden, folding laundry, and the last chocolate. And this is why I'm concerned with the idea of all these small, low-value, mundane tasks being the subject of automation without any question whatsoever as to what we'll lose in the process. Many of the categories from this study could be maintained into an era without small gestures. And maybe new ones will arise to fill in the gaps that are left, and this is all just concern for absolutely no reason. It's just as possible that we could reach a romance renaissance, a free time where what were once grand gestures become small ones, and even greater ones come to define the truly special, defining moments. But is that really possible when we've already covered how little time benefits truly get passed on to us? What if hours just keep going up because time at home now has less responsibility so we're expected to do more at work? Even if we get extra time to focus on these other aspects, is it really worth getting back a minute or two from not performing these tasks? When that minute or two spent on them is the thing most people say is the greatest proof of value in their relationships with others? Is a minute here or there really worth losing the beauty that these people express in their answers and a major way that we communicate care to all the others in general? Personally, I'm someone who lacks a major understanding of love. From my past, I'm most often unable to actually even say those three important words to someone face to face. And sometimes I don't think of myself as, as ever being the right person to say them anyway. There's much of romance I don't enjoy. But in return for the parts I do enjoy, I perform the actions I know I can. I drive to the places we go. I do the dishes that we both use. I clean up when there's a spare moment. If all of these tasks became automated, then the ways I'm able to express my care for important people in my life is suddenly lessened by so much. I always think back on a specific moment when me and a significant other were out with their friends in a night that so suddenly turned harsh and cold. I got overwhelmed from these new experiences, living for the first time, and because it was their place in a different city, there was no choice but for both of us to go home when I ruined the night. We ended up walking entire city blocks through the rain and cold, entirely unprepared, and it was all my fault. And as we did, I held them as close as I reasonably could while still being able to walk. And I said to myself inside the entire time, repeating, there are so many things that you'll mess up that you can't do, you idiot. But this is one small thing that you can always do. It's cold and you can keep them warm. That's something that won't specifically be automated away in any advancements we make. We can always keep each other warm. But the same sentiment which many actions carry very well may be lost. Roses by the stairs only mean something if it's not automatic. That partner can't put toothpaste on the toothbrush anymore if it's done for them both. You can't run a bath if it does so by itself. Automating these small tasks away moves us of something truly special. I can't say if it's a risk worth taking or not, but I can say for a fact that it's a risk we at least must consider before getting rid of.
That's what this entire process has been about. Consideration. We are at the cusp of human ingenuity's next era, where decades worth of effort are beginning to overflow into every aspect of our lives, just as has happened many times before. But these advancements are more rapid than ever before, at the same time as government responses famously lag behind technology to disastrous effects, in an era where corporate greed has only grown and grown, showcasing it would profiteer even from the deaths of millions during a global outbreak. These are the people driving the advancements and trying to sell you on them, the ones making absolutely dubious claims with absolutely no research behind them, disguising corporate interest as independent opinion, and yet their words are taken as gospel because they were in the right place at the right time to get rich. History has proven they will reshape the very fabric of our culture to abuse us for more and more money, that the benefits of the work we do will never go to reducing the time we work as things are now. In their constant focus on short-term gains, they'll fail to see the mire of stress which very well may rise from the employee being forever forced to chase only the high-value tasks, as solutions become less frequent and unique, leaving us to, much like AI's creative impact, simply copy ourselves over and over in exhaustion. As our lives at home are reshaped by the products they claim are the herald of a new age while they profit greatly from them, this will spill over into our houses. Less time on the tasks which allow us to consider the world and express our care, and more time spent with their advertisements and their messages. The long-term effects on our minds be damned. This is already the case as we enter an era shaped by constant connectivity, yet with no clear picture on how it impacts our minds. Entire generations have become test subjects for men who got rich from making hot or not lists. This is what I don't want to see happen even more. As we are forced to ponder again and again if true connectivity has been lost, or if truth is forever bound to ever-growing fiction, do we really want to add endless distress and the removal of all the small things to that list? Governments will not act quickly enough unless we speak. Everyone will buy without a second thought in the consumerism they created unless we speak. Everything we care about will be handled by those who profit from our distress unless we speak and resist. The fabric of society is always and forever changing. That cannot and should not be stopped. But that means we must direct its change. We must cut and sue that fabric as we see fit with active consideration, our minds wandering over the important issues which allow us to find solutions that maintain what we love without losing the benefits the future will bring. And this is something we can do. Remember the power expressed in our simple actions in plain words. You don't have to spend months making a stupid video to see the future you wish. All you have to do is think and act. What is the future that you want to see, not the one that you're told to see?